Okay, next up is a lecturer at Goldsmith University who used to work as a social worker in Leeds. He currently teaches on substance misuse and youth offending and has published research on young people and racism as well as on alcohol policy and street drinking. Please welcome Tom Henry. Hello, how are we doing? How is everyone? Okay, it's getting late now, isn't it? So I'll, I'll rattle through this. Um, so, yeah, my name's Tom and I like drinking. Who else likes drinking? Give me a cheers, you like drinking? Cheers! Yay! Okay, so I'm Tom, I like drinking, and my job is to do research. And what I've done here, you see, is I've mixed business with pleasure, haven't I? So, um, what, what I've done is done some research around drinking. And if you were to, to go to Google Scholar and search for alcohol studies, you will find thousands upon thousands of uh, peer-reviewed um, papers on, on drinking. And don't bother to read any of them, right? Because I'll sum them up in five words. It is bad for your liver. Sorry, six words. Uh, maths isn't my strong point. It's bad for your liver, right? Uh, we know that. I know that. You know that. We all know that. We've known that for a while. But we still do it, don't we? We still drink. So I like to think about how can we understand drinking in different frameworks? So perhaps might help us explain this. For example, what about sociability? What about pleasure? What about hospitality? What about community? These are important frameworks of thinking about drinking. Uh, in this talk tonight, I'm going to talk about drinking, uh, drinking in the streets, drinking in public spaces, and the regeneration, or rather gentrification, of uh, South East London. So, uh, quick plug. Um, this, is, uh, this, this talk comes from a chapter in this book I uh, co-edited with my friend Sophie Fuggle, Return to the Street. You can buy it from Houseman's Books down at King's Cross because they're a great independent bookshop and I suggest you do that or you could buy it on Amazon. Um, your choice. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on the uh, neighbourhood of Deptford. Yeah, we got a whoop for Deptford, was it? Get me, bruv. <laughs> Safe. Anyway. So, um, focus on Deptford, not as an idealised type, but as one example of how the process of urban regeneration could be analysed through the presence of street drinkers. This analysis will serve as a compass for understanding contemporary anxieties about urban redevelopment. So, let's start by thinking about the awkward place that alcohol, holds, alcohol holds in our society, uh, particularly in our social policy. So, alcohol licensing control systems, whatever their particularities, all share a difficult position having the regulation of personal consumption as their objective. This is an object that's kind of out of keeping with the logic of neoliberalism. And by neoliberalism, I mean broadly a range of policies that have evolved since the 1980s to make market functioning the overwhelming priority for social organisation. So regulation of personal consumption, it has, it's, it's illiberal. It doesn't fit with neoliberalism. Now, this illiberalism rarely gets examined in public. Um, Public discourses of alcohol controls usually relate to the form and severity of regulation rather than their ideological legitimacy. Take, for example, the recent, if ultimately doomed, uh, intention of introducing minimum alcohol pricing in the UK. Research in this area of public policy tends to focus on the potential impact on health behaviours, sidestepping or ignoring how the politics of exclusion are reinforced through the bolstering of social class divisions or through discrimination. The health economists can tell us how many lives could be saved from modelling this policy, but he can't tell us at whose expense. Uh, beyond the potential impact on people's health, academics and policymakers have little to say about alcohol regulation. A neoliberal context enables both regulation and exclusion of certain imbibing subjects. Now, the rise in neoliberalism last 40 years has coincided with a shift in productive forces in the UK. The shift has seen a move from industrial to post-industrial modes of production. Um, with this, the regulation of public spaces and leisure activities of the working classes has shifted from containment in the interests of defending capital to marketised consumption as a dominant form of social control. The liberalisation of liquor licensing hours in the United Kingdom is a clear example of the shift from containment to marketisation. Pubs no longer see serving at half ten on a Sunday night in order to regulate industrial workers. Instead, the constant lure of consumption is offered to, by extended opening hours and this conditions the neoliberal worker to work hard and play hard. So, uh, during the new Labour years, the UK experienced a significant liberalisation of the regulatory regime regarding the sale and consumption of alcohol. Anyone but this 2001 general election, uh, the, the Labour Party text couldn't give a 4x for last orders, vote Labour on Thursday for extra time. Yes, that's right, 2001 election was for over last orders. Um, 
So the 2003 Licensing Act introduced flexible opening hours for licensed premises with the potential for 24-hour sale of alcohol. Uh, the previous regime of fixed licensing hours had been enforced in some variants since 1914. However, further liberalisation of alcohol sales defenestrated the requirement that a licensee had to demonstrate need for further drinking establishments in the locality. Proponents of this change heralded it as a benefit to the nighttime economy and a reinvigoration of many post-industrial city centres. Distractors of the scheme blamed the instru this uh, instruction on the creation of binge drinking zones. Um, so as there's been a recasting of the regulation of personal consumption of alcohol, there's also been a shift in the regulation of public spaces. One of the most prominent tools regulating individuals in public spaces is the antisocial behaviour order. The ASBO, an ASBO, a recipient ASBO, uh, is perceived to be causing or likely to cause alarm, harassment or distress in a particular locality. An ASBO may have many conditions, uh, for example, you can be tagged, you can be, um, have a curfew and so on. It's worth noting that an ASBO is not a criminal order. A breach of an ASBO will potentially result in a criminal conviction, so one does not have to commit a criminal act in order to be a recipient of an ASBO, but if you breach an ASBO, you are a criminal. Um, with regards to this particular topic, i.e. public drinking in public space, the Greater London Authority further defines antisocial behaviour as, quote, threatening or physical, physically obstructing behaviours, stopping people using public or semi-public places, e.g. intimidating behaviour by groups of youths, aggressive begging, street drinking, or drug misuse, or curb crawling. So I want to consider now the enduring subject of the street drinker We're in the context of the shift in regulatory cultures and practices. One might expect that the liberalisation of alcohol consumption and the increased regulation of public spaces will have a deterrent effect on, on those considered to be street drinkers. Pubs open longer, competition reduced, reducing the price of alcoholic beverages, and increased chance of being reprimanded for public drinking. Instances of street drinking should de decrease. So, but we still have public drinking, we still have street drinkers, um, and I just want to consider briefly, historically, where, this, where our, uh, I suppose, our representation of street drinker has come from. This is uh, Hogarth's Gin Lane. You're all, you're all aware of this print by uh, Hogarth in 1817-something or other. Okay, so our historical imaginary of street drinking in London emerges from the 1750s during a period referred to as the Gin Craze. Hogarth's famous print, Gin Lane, as you see here, rendered in detail the depiction of morally deficient behaviour brought on by the overconsumption of gin. However, there is another subtext to this image. The setting is a public place, the street, the dress and the demeanour of the characters are intended to represent working class max drinking. Thus, Hogarth was making apparent the connection between public drunkenness and poverty. It is not public drunkenness itself which is concerned to Hogarth, rather the artist is alerting his audience to potential caused by public drunkenness by the poor in the new urbanised London. Gin Lane is not a, mor a, a morality tableau about the evils of public drinking, it is about the evils or the threat to public order of a new urban working class. Uh, more recent concerns for street drinking in London emerged in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the UK's first Alcohol Anonymous group started in Croydon in 1952, um, bringing a particular form of treatment around alcoholism as a disease and the cure is abstinence. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous brought a new way of problematizing drinking and drunkenness um, with the modern notion of the habitual drunk. But in the early 1960s, a group of psychiatrists in the Maudsley Hospital started to develop ideas about how to treat skid row drinkers, homeless drunks, and able to help themselves. This laid the groundwork both medically and culturally for the street drinker. So what's, so what's this got to do with Deptford? Deptford is currently undergoing a period of regeneration. An example of this regeneration occurred last year when the old job centre, once a labour exchange for the destitute, reopened as a bar called, yes, the job centre. Quote, featuring quirky design features inspired by its function as a place that once served the unemployed. Isn't that nice? Okay. Till very recently, uh, one of the most prominent signs of entry into Deptford was a large anchor installed in a low brick, brick plinth at the junction of Deptford High Street and New Cross Road. The importance of this road to shipping and trade cannot be understated. Deptford was an important sea trading port in its time. Strong maritime tradition. The anchor sat at the, seven end, the southern end of uh, Deptford High Street, fully visible from the A2, a reminder to console haulage and global trade the role Deptford played in the development and maintenance of the British Empire. It was probably due to the location of the, of the anchor at the point where Deptford High Street adjoins the A2, uh, providing a vista onto the comings and going continental trade along with its low brick plinth, which made it a perfect height for sitting down, that made the anchor a popular place for a group of street drinkers. 
Most days, one could observe a number of street drinkers who would congregate and socialise at the Anchor. As of June 2013, however, the Anchor had disappeared from public view. Removed by London Borough of Lewisham Council along with the Plinth, and so the group of street drinkers. The Anchor was removed as part of the Council's regeneration plan for Deptford High Street. Now, although the regeneration plan doesn't mention the existence or the removal of, of the uh, Deptford Anchor drinkers, there are subtle clues that removing a particular street drinking aesthetic and replacing it in another street visiting aesthetic was an intentional element of the regeneration plan. A regeneration plan which uh, eventually will have inflationary effects on both commercial and residential property price in the area, effectively enabling developers to extract greater value from the area which has been left to decay for the last 20 years. Now street drinkers constitute abject fig figures within our neoliberal uh, economy and subject to many and various forms of social control. There are several ways that street drinkers are cast as abject, one of which is due to the consumption of low price per alcohol beverages. This is surely a question of taste, and I mean by taste I mean both taste as in you know, what goes on in your tongue and taste as in distinction, the sociological kind of meaning. For a good, uh, for, uh, my, my friend Alex Reese taylor does some really good stuff on this, but the relationship between taste and taste. Um, yeah, check him out. Anyway, so it is this uh, Diabject's taste for cheap yet strong alcohol beverages that often marks him on her out from a respectable drinker. The abject street drinker plays by the neoliberal rules. He, he finds, he or she finds the best price for the products that he or she wishes to imbibe. Yet, by doing this, the abject street drinker is marked out as unruly. So, um, so, this, so it's about uh, lack of taste or distaste or disgust that clearly relates to people's behavioural expectations, behaviour which is beyond the conventional norms of acceptability and beyond people's behavioural expectations that is for that particular environment. So it is not street drinking per se that is condemned as distasteful or disgusting, but rather the context of the drinking and the subjugation of the drinker. In order to illustrate the point, uh, I want to briefly consider the neighbouring borough of Suffolk. You walk around Suffolk, you will... Look up at the lamppost, you will see small notices like this. Actually, you won't see this one. Sorry, these are, this is actually the alcohol control zone sign for around here for the London Borough of uh, Camden. Um, but there are similar ones in, in Suffolk. There are small print the ones in Suffolk reads, a police officer or authorised person can ask you to stop drinking in this area. So on one hand, we have a form of street drinking which can be censored, while on the other, similar behaviour can be tolerated or even promoted. Street drinking in the context of the abject drinker can be subject to myriads a range of social control measures, the Osbo and so the, these alcohol control zones and all this sort of thing. Um, yet on the other side, we have this sort of whole thing about post-industrial urban renewal and liberalisation of uh, li uh, liquor licensing in order to regenerate areas. So we've got these sort of contradictory messages of, about um, who is and who isn't allowed to drink in public spaces. The rudimentary discourse analysis of these two diverging policy orientations enables to identify who is allowed to drink in public without censor, and who uh, will potentially be constructed as problematic, antisocial, or even criminal. The message is clear even if the policy, policy is conflicted. There is respectable street drinking and there is distasteful street drinking. What appears to separate the two is aesthetics. Now this aesthetic contradiction of ways of being in the street appears in other form. Graffiti is a street art form which is both admired and simultaneously categorised as evidence of urban blight. Banksy. Uh, or where Banksy, Bristol based, uh, we went to Dismal Land last week, it's great. Um, Bristol based graffiti artists often deemed to create works of artistic merit worthy of preservation by local authorities. The same local authorities who spend millions of pounds every year cleansing streets of graffiti. Um, indeed, uh, I've got a, a quote here from the Brighton Argus newspaper reported that uh, in relation to this particular piece of uh, Banksy's work in Brighton. Two men have been convicted of criminal damage after painting over one of Brit uh, Brighton's most photographed pieces of graffiti. Hang on a minute. So is, it, is that graffiti? Anyway, uh, so this contradictory approach to graffiti exposes the paradox of urban aesthetics. Both Banksy and those who damage his works are essentially committing acts of vandalism, yet one form is celebrated and the other for as a symbol of post-industrial urban renaissance and the other is evidence of decline and decay. Same paradox applies to street drinking. The promotion of continental nighttime economy destinations aims to rejuvenate urban centres, yet street drinking outside these terms is deemed to be potentially antisocial behaviour. So where does this leave us in terms of aesthetics, urban space, public drinking and Deptford? Deptford is currently undergoing a number of urban regeneration projects, most ambitious and contentious of which is the Convoy's Wharf development. 
Um, this development will undoubtedly bring money into an area which has so far seen very little post-industrial re revival. However, these regeneration projects will shift the character and social milieu of the districts. One effect of the overheated housing market in London is that property developers are constantly on the lookout for the next area they can turn a profit. The formula is familiar to many of us who have lived in London over the last well, 20 years or so, I suppose. Areas are left to decay until property prices are, are such that artists and other creative types move into the area. They open small bohemian type businesses, creating a sense of the area happening. This is often called urban renaissance. Then the property developers move in with the blessings of the local authority, citing herbal renewal. They buy up all the cheap property and sell it on at a fantastic profit. As people of a wealthier strata move into the area, the existing populations get squeezed out and the process of gentrification is complete. So Deptford is an area currently being transformed from urban blight to urban regeneration through gentrification. Part of the process of improving property values involves changing the spatial aesthetic of the neighbourhood. So returning to the paradox of street drinking, Street drinkers, drinking. The drinkers who used to frequent the Deptford Anchor represented and even embodied the Deptford of relatively low rents and urban decay. By designing out the existing street drinkers, urban planners and the architects of urban gentrification can create space of public imbibing reserved for respectable drinkers. The street drinkers paradox persists. The street drinkers at the Anchor signified um, that this was an area of urban blight, ready for investor capital to swoop in and extract huge profits. Yet. To increase the value of the properties in the area requires the absence of, street, of, of derelict street drinkers from public view. Thus the question of who drinks in the street informs us of whether the gentrification project has been successful in civilising the area. So as I draw towards the end of this talk, I want to return back to uh, Hogarth's famous print in Lane. I said that was about, you know, represented anxieties of the time in the 1750s about urbanisation. And I want to, from this talk, posit in a way that representation of street drinking today persists and perhaps reflect our anxieties about, um, not about urbanisation, but about urban regeneration. So um, thank you very much. Um, buy the book from Houseman's.